This is a time when anyone in my position wants to be especially profound, right? Because we're just coming back. We're going through something very traumatic, and we all want to be able to say something that is revolutionary and piercing to the very center of the moment for everyone, but most people in my position aren't that gifted. And I began to be thinking about the examples that we have in the Bible of those who encountered situations like this. If this moment in time for you has felt like it is for me, it's been sort of like going through a fog, kind of a what is really going on sort of a time in our lives where we're trying to come through the fog, but we're disoriented. You ever driven through a fog or you're standing and you're not exactly sure how far away something is or where you are exactly? There's no real uh, point, a fixed point of reference or something like that. And begin to think about those who were in the wilderness and when they became disoriented spiritually. Because that really is what the threat is right now. That yeah, we have we have disorientation maybe when it comes to jobs or relationships or things like that. But spiritually, we can be disoriented. We can be thinking in, in terms of the flesh that, that really change the way that our spiritual focus is. I'm not going to be using the screen, but I encourage you to turn to the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers, of course, the alternate title for that is In the Wilderness. You have the, the children of Israel who are wandering in the wilderness and because of this time of wondering and of challenges, they often begin to act, if you will, in a disoriented way. And they needed to be reoriented. So I want to start in Numbers 21. Numbers 21, starting in verse 4. And I'm sure you know this story. Numbers 21, verse 4. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Quote, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people. Many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, put it on a pole, and so it was. If the serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. And we saw this over and over again, where they would complain about how horrible things were, and that they wanted to go back to the way things were in Egypt. When they had been given a completely new world, a second chance, they'd been taken out of slavery, they'd been given a covenant with God, and they began to complain over and over again. And what does God do? In a sense, he sends them a plague of snakes that bite them. And their, their spiritual disorientation turns into a physical disorientation. And they, they cry out. They understand, you know what? We haven't really been thinking properly. We've been sinning against you, against God. Please help us. And so the Lord instructs Moses to make a bronze serpent. Which, I mean, depending on your knowledge of history and you look at the pagan gods as well, you know, it's a common uh, medical symbol, the, the serpent that's raised up, right? And they would, anyone that had been bitten, if they turned and looked at it, they would be healed. That if they would, if they would change their perspective, if they would change their orientation, you see, they had to change their spiritual orientation first, and then they would turn in trusting and in faith in God, turn 
physically oriented themselves to look at the bronze serpent, they would be healed. You would think, okay, under those circumstances, why would anyone not turn and look at it, right? Why would anyone not do that? Well, it's kind of the same thing as why would anyone not come to God through Christ? There's not ever really a good reason that there are people that don't do it. But this is a time where they were in a disoriented state because of a spiritual circumstance that caused them to rebel spiritually. And then God inflicted them even more with a physical disorientation. Now, I, I, I only go to that story to set up another passage. So, so suspend that story in your mind because it's important. And here's what's great about this. What's great about going to the stories of old, the, the Old Testament passages, is that sometimes the significance or the importance of many places, many events in the Old Testament are not fully known until we go to the New Testament and we see how someone in the New Testament references it. And I hope you already know where I'm going. If you don't, go with me to John chapter 3 and verse 1. John chapter 3 and verse 1. Now, typically, when we go to John chapter 3, verse 1, we look at Jesus meeting Nicodemus. But that's not where he stops. And we need to connect some dots. A lot of times, what I'm going to cover right now are covered as three different things. But they're all right there together because they're all tied together. And so let's start in chapter 3, verse 1. John 3, 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you. We speak what we know and testify what we see, what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What do we have here? As I begin thinking about what this is, and I mean what we're doing here today, we have, in a lot of ways, we have hit the reset button. I'll never forget my dad not understanding, and this this would would date this reference. Do you remember when you would go uh, on your computer screen to shut it down? What did you have to click to shut down your computer? You had to click the start button, right? He never understood what why that made any sense. I'm going to turn it off. Why am I going to hit the start button? But then you hit the start button. What comes up? These options, right? You can shut it down. You put it on sleep mode or something like that. You also restart it. Sometimes my phone is a little over two years old, and every once in a while, I don't have to turn it off and turn it back on. Sometimes an app on your phone doesn't work right. You turn it back and turn it back on because it in this reset, it it's sometimes it's getting cluttered up with too many things. Maybe the bandwidth isn't enough. Maybe you're asking it to do what it can't do. I've heard of computers that start to smoke and catch on fire because whoever's on that computer is asking it to do more than it can do. 
we are at a time where it is up to us if we really embrace this moment as a time to hit the reset button. Now, I want you to think of it this way. We haven't really had a choice, have we? It's been pushed on all of us. And we can come through it to borrow from Jesus. We can be born again through it. A birth is not a fun experience, right? We, we, are, we are getting uh, pressured through, you might say, squeezed out the other end of this difficult situation. And none of us are enjoying this, really. If you are, let me know what's going on in your mind. I don't know. Maybe your life hasn't changed. Maybe you sit and watch Nick at night all the time. I don't know. But uh, for most people, it's misery. We have, what, about 40 million unemployed? We have uh, depression and suicide going up a lot. We'll get to that in a minute. But this is a moment that we can embrace if we choose. As I've stated before, what this feels like is a fog. And as we're starting to come out the other end, I wanted us to start where we needed to start. With the fixed point of reference. The people in the wilderness, they were disoriented spiritually, they became disoriented physically. And they needed a fixed point of reference. That Jesus then uses in John chapter 3, where he's talking to Nicodemus, who is well intended, but maybe is a little dense. I think everybody that talked to Jesus was dense in comparison to Jesus. His apostles were dense. People that he spoke to in parables were dense. They weren't quite getting what he was saying totally. I'll get to that in a minute. And he tells him, you must be born again. Well, what are you talking about? Born? That's impossible. No, no, no. You've got to be born again. But then he continues through. And he says what? He says, in the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too will the Son of Man be lifted up. Because the Father sent the Son to save the world. Because he loved the world. The Son didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see, what Jesus is establishing in John chapter 3 is the fixed point of reference that cures the disorientation. If you feel like you're in a fog, you feel disoriented, you feel like I'm not exactly sure, you know, if my, my feet are on solid ground, I think we're all feeling that to a certain extent. Let me encourage you to go first and foremost to the only place that doesn't move. And that is our Savior lifted up. That's, that's what Jesus says it is. You want to be born again. Then you need to train your eyes on me, he says. That's why I came. That's where we have to start. If we're to come out of this with, if you will, a spiritual reset. We need to go back to ground zero. Jesus is our fixed point of reference beyond anything else. This is tied to apologetics, the moral argument for God. It is, it is he who is immovable, who is unchanging, uh, who is always faithful. And because of that, you can always know where you are because you can always know where he is. So when we take our eyes off of him, then we are really in the fog. And sometimes we are, we are thrust into a situation, like in Numbers, where they say, you know what, I'm really not doing so well right now. And I'm really beginning to worry about where my next paycheck is going to come from or something like that. You know, that's essentially what they were doing. We don't have any food, we don't have any water, we would have been better being slaves. That's, that's what, it, what it means to be, to be consumed or to be tricked in focusing or refocusing back on the things that are right in front of you, rather than looking far ahead to the future or looking towards the Savior that's been lifted up. In this way, we become disoriented. And Jesus says there is a way to reorient yourself. 
And he talks about that in terms of being reborn. Look, when you become a Christian, you are born again. Definitely. But the beautiful thing about the rebirth process is that really it's a, it's a ongoing thing. And I'll get to that as we go through. I've started a uh, maybe a reset of my own. When I finished school, I had resolved that I was going to read the Bible through all the way, but I was going to read it through one book at a time and one setting at a time. And let me encourage you that even the longest, I mean, there's two or three books that are maybe like, I think Psalms is like five hours long if you read it out loud. But even the, some of the, most of the longest books are about as long as your favorite movie probably. And most of the books of the Bible are about as long as your, you know, a TV episode. You just sit down and read it out loud. And a couple weeks ago, I read out loud the book of Mark. It took me, I think, one hour. And something, something jumped out to me in the book of Mark. You want to open there. In chapter 8, Mark 8, verse 31, Jesus says something. Then he repeats it. And then he repeats it. And then he repeats it. Mark 8, 31, Jesus says, well, Mark records this. He began to teach them. That the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Chapter 9 and verse 31. Mark 9, 31. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. When he is killed, after three days he will rise again. You go to chapter 10, Mark 10. Starting verse 32, it's almost like clockwork. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was, what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spill him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. Now, whether or not you think that this is the most significant thing that Jesus taught his apostles, you could say that maybe the, the thing that Jesus spoke about the most would be, to sum it up, preaching the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. But we find in the private moments with his disciples, he repeats over and over again. You know, there's going to come a day where I'm going to be taken. I'm going to be falsely tried, handed over, killed. I'm going to rise again. And he tells them that over. Now, now, it's recorded three times in Mark. And Mark's the shortest of, of, of the gospel accounts. We have no idea how many times he really told them. But he told them over and over and over again. He continued. Go a few more chapters. Mark chapter 14. What do we find? The institution of the Lord's Supper. As they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Very similar wording, but, but he institutes this Lord's Supper around these significant points that he had been telling them over and over and over again. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be killed. You know, when he tells Nicodemus, you're, you're, you're going to have to be born again. And the way you're going to do that is by drawing your focus towards me as I'm lifted up. He tells his disciples, I'm going to be taken, I'm going to be killed, but I'm going to rise over and over and over again. And then he makes a memorial of it. And I would submit to you that the objective of the Lord's Supper as a memorial is for us, really, to hit the reset button. That, that really is what it's for. Because the whole idea of a memorial is to bring your disoriented gaze 
back to focus. That's what the Lord's Supper is for. I began to be thinking about how I wanted to do an abbreviated lesson because we're going to have a lot of time. I wanted to tie something to the Lord's Supper. But as I began to dig and think and study, what I saw is that from the very beginning, even from the time that, that the Lord told Moses, you know what, make a fiery serpent, they turn to it, they'll live. That even the divine mind of God, at that moment, he was already preaching the gospel to them of what it would take for them to be born again. It takes a reorientation. It takes a refocus. It takes a return to that fixed point of reference. Jesus' death is the only way to a restart button. Or another word for it would be resurrection. You know, in a lot of ways, symbolically, but even in a full impact of what the resurrection does for us, this moment in time really is a resurrection. Like we're, we're kind of rising out of the ashes and the dust of a world pandemic of all things. It's like the science fiction, right? And yet we have an opportunity if we have, if we have our eyes on the right place, on the right person, on the right event. He says, this is the pathway to what? Not only am I going to be taken and tried, flogged and killed. Well, the third day I'm going to rise again. And the way to get to that rebirth or that reset or that resurrection is through my death. And so, and so I'm going to institute for you a memorial that brings you to the foot of the cross over and over and over again. Because that's always where you need to start. God a lot of people say, some, sometimes sounds cliche, is a God of second chances. He's a God of transformation. He's a God of taking what is dead and making it alive again. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. And the wonderful thing about the Christian life is that even if at one point you become disoriented, you, you can come back. And the resurrection can have its full impact on you once again. You can have a, sort of, you might say, a rebirth all over again. You can come back and make things right. And writing to the church of Corinth, we've studied through this. Oh boy, what do we know about the Corinthian church? First, we know that chapters 1 through 6 on what? Paul's writing to Corinth about a bunch of things that probably they didn't know that he knew about. That the household of Chloe had informed him. Hey, this stuff's going on in Corinth. And so he writes chapters 1 through 6 are addressing division, addressing sexual morality, addressing all sorts of things that he says, look, you probably didn't know that I knew these things, but hey, I'm I'm coming, it's, it's, you know, full double-barrel shotgun, so to speak, in those first six chapters. And then chapter 7, verse 1, he says, now I'm going to get to the things that you've asked me about. And it kind of changes gears a little bit. But he is addressing a church who's in the center. And for those that I think Tom Pine been there, for those who have been in this place, you know the, the layout of the city and the, the temple and uh, what would be the normal culture of the, of the day. And even going to chapter 6, 10, 11, 12, listing their sins that they participated, their lifestyles that they had. They were washed, sanctified, justified. They used to be like that, but weren't even more. But what? They were in need of reorientation. Obviously, because of all the things that they were, that they were doing, that he was addressing, that he was coming full force at them with. And so... Where does he eventually get to? He brings us to what Jesus reoriented us with. The focus. What he deemed to be the most significant thing that we needed to remember. His death. 
So you go to 1 Corinthians 11, 23. We, we read this often before the Lord's Supper. But we need to think about this within the terms of a people who are in a spiritual pod who need, they need to hit the restart button. They need reorientation. They need to fix their eyes again on Christ because they've been claiming to be Christians and have been acting like it. 1 Corinthians 11, 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night which he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. In other words, if you're just going through the motions, if you're just a, a Christian in name only, if, if you are claiming to be a Christian but your eyes are not fixed on the cross, if you hold the name of Christ but you're in a spiritual fog and you're spiritually disoriented, he says, come back to the foot of the cross. Come, come, come back to what Jesus told you to do in this memorial, what he did. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. We can go into a, a, a lengthy discourse about what it means for them to not discern the Lord's body, whether it's the individual members or whether it's Jesus himself in his broken body. The Lord's Supper is designed as a memorial, as a time where we can reset our focus, where we can reset our resolve. We can reset our faith through a memorial of Christ. Our hearts are brought back to spiritual center, back to that fixed and unmoving point that Jesus died for us and purchased us with his blood. And so let's ask ourselves a few questions. As we look within ourselves, you know, Paul describes this as a reset when he says, when you do this, examine yourself. Examine yourself. I could say this in every lesson, and it wouldn't get old, even if it feels like it's getting old. Examine yourself. Even Paul says that he had to examine himself. Ask yourself about your spiritual orientation. Are there places where you're failing? Are there places that need improvement? Maybe, and, and I'm hoping that this has helped us to see what things are important. Maybe we've taken assembly for granted. Maybe we've taken it for granted. Maybe we haven't made that a spiritual priority. Maybe we haven't dedicated ourselves to encouraging one another to love and good works, as we find in Hebrews 10. Uh, maybe you need to reset the dedication of what you bring to the table to the work of the kingdom. Maybe you have not been giving God really what he's blessed you with. You haven't been returning that to him. Maybe you're not prioritizing evangelism. You know, I stated earlier that depression, suicide, Unemployment, all sorts of things, uh, spousal abuse, child abuse, these things, and most of it is unknown as far as these things go. But we know that they're increasing. You, you probably experienced, I, I probably experienced some depression and didn't even really know it, but maybe felt it, but wouldn't label it necessarily. We're all in a really strange place. But I want you to think about people who aren't here. They don't, they don't have the mindset to even 
to even turn to God in the first place. They don't even realize that there is, you know, go back to the book of Numbers, they don't realize that something has been lifted up for them to turn to and look at. There are people out there who wish that they could reset. And we have the way to help them do that. There are people that you know that wish that they could do what only they could do through Christ, but they don't know how. Have you purposed yourself for that? Maybe you need to reset, reset what you have purposed to give to the church. Maybe you're just struggling a difficult time right now, but maybe you can give in different ways. Maybe as I, I've been trying to do, maybe you need to reset your study habits, your prayer habits, and maybe your joint Bible study with people. I've had some really great experiences studying uh, with BJ and Alex, with Mark and with Isaiah even, and it has been one of the most beneficial things that we've ever done. Just three of us in a room can be more enriching than this. And so let's not forsake that just because we're back here. Maybe you need to reset holy living. Maybe you need to take holiness seriously and tackle and take seriously the sin that's in your life. Maybe you need to reset your relationships. Maybe you need to prioritize a spiritual focus in your relationships. And if you're, if you're a husband or a father, Maybe you need to reset your spiritual leadership in the home. Maybe as parents, you need, you need to make the center of your, your children's world Jesus. How many children, because parents haven't taken this seriously, even in the church, their children are, are in the fog and they're in the wilderness because they don't have that fixed point of reference that they're looking at. Maybe you need to reset just the whole direction of your life. The, the spiritual trajectory that you can see yourself on. Maybe you need to reset your, your whole life. Maybe you're not a Christian. I don't know if we have any visitors here. Do we have some visitors? We have more people than I thought we have. I'll tell you that. I'm encouraged. Thank you for being here. Tomorrow, just... Just by chance. You know, I'm not one for holidays. I never know when they are. Tomorrow's what? Memorial Day. And what do people say on Memorial Day or times like that when you think about people who are in the military and died? We say stuff like what? You know, they died for their country. They died for our freedom. Or because of what they did, I'm standing here today, right? And I saw a picture of my grandfather where he's pointing to his brother's name. Who died just a few weeks before World War II was over with. It was on a, a memorial day in his hometown. And they were both in the military. And what people would say about, about those types of people, and we memorialize them. And we memorialize them because what? Because we say that we have benefited because of what they did in their life and even in their death. And when we, we, we memorialize Christ, because we recognize that we have benefited from what he did in his life and what he did in his death. That's why it's so powerful for a Christian to memorialize Christ. That's why it's so significant. And that's why it's of no significance for a non-Christian to memorialize Jesus. Because someone who isn't a Christian, someone who is still in the fog spiritually, someone who is spiritually disoriented, Someone who has not fixed their eyes on him and come to him yet. They have no benefit from him at all. His blood has not washed them. His blood has not purchased them. His resurrection has not transformed them. And so even if they were to participate in the Lord's Supper, they cannot truly memorialize him. We need to understand the significance of what we're doing when we're turning our eyes back to him. And so when we think about sharing the gospel with someone, we, what are we sharing with them? This is what Jesus did. We are memorializing Jesus. That's all sharing the gospel is, is memorializing him to someone else. Look what he did not only for me, but for you if you'll let him. And so becoming a Christian is what? Becoming a Christian is embracing what he did for me so that what? 
so that what he did actually counts for me. So that what? So I'm no longer disoriented. So that what? So that I can be born again. So that I can be transformed. So that my whole life can be totally reset because the direction of my life has changed. Our lives are either a memorial to Jesus or not. And I want to end by going to one passage and then I'll be done. Romans 12. I know it's already 10 o'clock. I'm sorry. I knew we'd start late, but that's okay. Romans 12, starting in verse 1. You know this. We look at a couple of, couple of translations. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. The English Standard Version says, which is your spiritual worship. He says, and do not be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, verse 2 is what we're talking about, isn't it? Verse 2 really is this idea of a transformation by what? A renewal of the mind, and how does that happen? Jesus says, you want to be born again? In the same way that Moses lifted up the serpent of the wilderness, so people will turn to me. I'll be lifted up. And that's the plea that he gives. That's the plea from God. Turn, turn to Jesus. Don't be conformed to this world with your mind, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Be oriented correctly in your mind. You see, because this is the way to understand verse 1. Look at verse 1 again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service, or which is your spiritual worship. Now, this translation, it falls short of really saying what's going on here. The word there for reasonable or spiritual, you know what that word is? It's where we get our word logic from. Uh, it, it's the idea of what makes sense. Now, it's translated to spiritual, I think, because they're saying it's what makes sense spiritually. Or it's a spiritual reaction. And then the next word is a word that is one of the two words that is, that is sometimes translated worship. But really is the word that would be designated as the term that the priests would be serving in the temple or the tabernacle. And so he says what? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. When you reverse engineer this, then what? What do you have? You have a not conforming to this world, but being transformed by the renewal of your mind. And when you do that, what happens? You go back to verse 1. You present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. Because why? Because what made sense or what was logical or what was reasonable when you renewed your mind, when you turned to Christ, was to do what? As priests to serve as what? As sacrifices to Christ. This passage is not as simple as saying, well, apparently all of life is worship because everything I do is worship because my whole life is a sacrifice. It's not really what it's saying. What he's saying is that when you come to this fixed point of reference and you have a transformed and a renewed mind, that it manifests itself, its reasonable response to looking to the Savior lifted up is to fall in line with his priesthood as priests serving in his kingdom or in his temple, sacrificing yourself. In other words, you are a living memorial to Jesus or you're not. What do you need to reset? If you're not a Christian, you can come to him today. He can wash you clean by his way. He can transform you totally. If you believe that he's the Son of God, if you'll make him your Lord, you'll be unashamed of that. If you'll allow him to transform your life in a total surrender, when you give up your own will, and you take his will to your life. You identify with his death, burial, resurrection, and baptism. And you're raised in a way where you can then say, 
This man who came and died and was raised, he has, he has transformed my life. He came and died so that I could live. If you haven't done that, do you? Randy, you want to have a song of encouragement? Yes, amazing grace. If you have any need, let me tell you. Things are weird right now. I'm going to try to be available. Deacons, elders, we're at a weird time. We're at a difficult time. There may be things you're going through that we don't know about. Don't pass this up. If you need help, we want to help you. We want to help you. And so, either now or later, if you have a need, let's all stand and sing.